We'll incorporate all of that. I will try and add this in. That was the feedback that you gave me. The group project. We, I've actually shortened today's operant, uh, operant conditioning and response and uh, behavioral reactivity discussion in order to allow time in the back end for discussing the group project. So we're going to go over recent updates, we're going to go over upcoming deadlines, and I will field questions during that time. This is our last lecture in this class. Right? From here on out, our main meetings we have guests coming in, which is an opportunity for y'all to explore different performance psychology adjacent kind of career paths. And, but that also means that I want you to be doing some pre-reading about our guests. I'd like you to be submitting questions that you'd like to ask the guests, because I'd like to send that to them with a couple of days advance notice so they can do a little bit of prep, but this can be a real meaningful time to have them in here. So you have pre-reading and a submission form for your questions. I get it, not all of you are gonna be interested and not all of our guests. So as part of your submission form, I am asking you to rank how important is this question, how interested are you in this guest, okay? And I'm gonna use that to filter to questions for people that, that are particularly interested in getting an ask versus those people that are just submitting for points. So please be honest in those rankings. If you have a guest that you're like, I really want to ask this person a question, that's fine, let us know. But if you have a guest where you're like, I'm just showing up for points, that's also fine. Let us know so that we can get the, the real meaningful questions asked and not get lost in those notes. Okay, peer feedback. We have had some people no show, no communication. Just report them on the peer feedback. Related to peer feedback, you are submitting one feedback for each of your other group members for each submission deadline. So if you're in group of five, that means each person is submitting four feedback forms each time. If you're in group of six, you're submitting five. Is that clear? Each time. Okay. All right, so we are diving into Operating conditioning and behavioral reactivity. This is the last of our discussions about learning processes for performance psychology. In our last lecture, we covered respondent conditioning, which sums up very, very shortly to how to influence reflex behaviors using pairing. And we also discussed sampling methods, which was how to gather behavioral data when, when live continuous data collection is not feasible. We said that the live continuous data collection was the gold standard, but it's not always possible, and so we use other things like EMA, like permanent product, right? like sampling methods that are intermittent, not whole interval, and, and those are ways to get around the challenges of gathering all data all the time. Now we're going into operant conditioning, which we're leveling up in complexity a little bit. Operant conditioning is the learning process that requires three elements. A target context for the behavior to occur in, a target behavior itself, and consequences of that behavior. Operant conditioning is defined by how consequences affect the future probability of the behavior. It's a form of learning in which the frequency of behavior is controlled by its consequences. We categorize something as operantly conditioned or operantly trained or an operant behavior if our target behavior is not an unconditioned reflex or a conditioned reflex. With either of these, we're going to use respondent or respondent conditioning or habituation. But when we're dealing with something that is not a reflex, trained or untrained, then we're dealing with operant behavior. And so, if we don't have a reflex and we have to train operantly, we are going to manipulate consequences. That's our main manipulation. Our secondary one is context. But most of the time we use context as like, in this context, we're manipulating consequences. All right, let's see if this works. Here's a quick demonstration for, for reference. Skinner is credited as like the father of operant conditioning, and here's an example of him conducting 
operating conditions. This could be a very, very fast process as far as training goes. I'm going to try another pigeon now, and uh, I will try to pick out some particular pattern of behavior and uh, make it uh, more, a more frequent part of the repertoire of the bird. Very fine. The bird is, uh, has been uh, already conditioned to eat when the, when the magazine sounds and the light flashes. Now we'll just watch its behavior a bit. It's not doing anything in particular, you see. But I'm going to try to get it to do something. Suppose I shape up the behavior of making a complete turn. What I do is simply as I did then, to wait for some part of that uh, behavior. There's more of it, you see. Well, you can see the effect is instantaneous. I'm waiting for it to turn counterclockwise now. And then I reinforce that movement. And I wait for a more pronounced movement than that. It's got to be more than that.
So, when we're talking about that pigeon video, let's break it down. What was the antecedent context or stimulation for the pigeon? Antecedent means before. So maybe maybe we should go out of order here. What is the target behavior that we're trying to influence for the pigeon? The spin. The spin. Right. So that was the target behavior. So what was present before the spin? What would the pigeon have experienced before spinning behavior? Was there any consistent thing in the pigeon's environment in that moment? I think the light was only flashing when the pigeon actually had access. So I think that was on the conservation side. The sound? Was it even magazine? Yeah, the, the feeder is called the magazine. Kind of kind of like a, Hopper or a, yeah, it's a, it's a synonym for the theater itself. Yeah, and that thunk noise was the door opening and closing. But again, that was on the concentration side. That was after the behavior. Who was there the entire time? Who was the one talking? Skinner. Skinner. Yeah. So one of the antecedents may have been like in the classroom or in the presence of Skinner or standing on that stand. Maybe it was only on that stand that behavior was contemplated in general. This one's, this one's a little challenging because he didn't focus on the antecedent conditions. But those are, whether we intentionally do it or not, whatever stimulus precedes the behavior becomes the antecedent condition. This can also be a place, this can also be a source of problems when we're talking about performance psychology. Because sometimes, like we talked about in respondent conditioning with like um, conditioned drug tolerance, in offering conditioning, sometimes we can accidentally condition certain discriminative stimulus, certain antecedent stimulus. And so being aware that stimulus that reliably precede conditioning can become predictors for it and can exert stimulus control. So the target behavior was turning counterclockwise, and I want to really point out, counterclockwise turning behavior was not reflexive. We are, when we're talking about operant conditioning, I'll say this a couple times, but when we're talking about operant conditioning, we're talking about training behaviors that we don't inherit. When you think about the spectrum of behaviors that we learn, only a small group are ones that we inherit, and a massive amount, 80-90% or more, are ones that are not inherited, non-reflexive. So when we're talking operant conditioning, we're talking about influencing the majority of behaviors that we do. And finally, what was the consequence for rotating for the pigeon? What was the reliable regular outcome of turning behavior? Say that a little louder. The food, access to the food, at least temporary access to food. That was the clunk of the magazine over and over. Yep. Okay. For this, well, we'll talk about it in a second, actually. Okay. So the process itself, we need to choose a wing. Okay. We need to pick some sort of specific antecedent stimuli. This is the conditions when we want a target to, <coughs> to occur. What might be, what might be a win? for a performance behavior. Somebody throw out a performance behavior. Maybe sports performance behavior. Um, shooting a basketball. Shooting a basketball. Yeah. Um, Let's go ahead and narrow that down a little bit to a free throw. Okay. okay. What would the antecedent stimulus be for that you would want for good free throw behavior? What's 
something that a player does right before they throw the free throw? Uh, the routine. Yeah, pre-shot routine. Or maybe stepping up to the, to the free throw line. Okay, so that's the win right before, whatever is experienced right before the target behavior is the antecedent. And then in this case, the what is the target behavior, which we said was? Making shots or shooting. Shooting, yeah, making, it's out of our hands. We, we can't you know, get up there and put it in the basket, but we can shoot and we can have specific form. Okay. So we need a what, which is the target behavior, it's whatever response we need to occur. This takes us back to the discussion of form or function. Sometimes we want a very specific form, like how the wrist is released, where you hold the ball beforehand. Okay? Sometimes we just need it by function. So there could be many different ways in which it happens, as long as it happens in that antecedent, in the presence of the antecedent condition. Okay? And finally, we need to choose an outcome, which is our consequence. And this is where it gets confusing. Okay. Consequences have functions and they are experienced. The function is how the behavior changes because of the consequence. Most of you have probably heard this term before, reinforcing and punishing, but they are very specific technical terms when it comes to operant conditioning. To say that a behavior is rein, uh, a consequence is reinforcing is to say that when a person experiences that consequence, the behavior that produced it will be more frequent next time. Reinforcing says behavior will be more frequent next time. If we say that a consequence is punishing, we are clearly stating that the behavior that produced the consequence will be less frequent next time. Now, just because it has that function doesn't mean it's consistently experienced. And so we have to describe another way that it's experienced. We can experience things as what we call positive. Think of it like math adding something to the individual's environment, or it can be negative, mathematically subtracting something from the individual's environment. This reinforcing, punishing, positive, negative, we're gonna practice this a little bit. Because it creates this two by two matrix where we can have positive reinforcers, positive punishers, negative reinforcers, or negative punishers. So, in this upper left quadrant, the positive reinforcer, the positive term means what? Consequence was experienced how? To describe a consequence as being positive means it was experienced in what way? What does it say up there? the behavior's environment. What does that make you think of? What comes to mind? An incentive. An incentive. Elaborate on this. What, what might be an example of an incentive? Like money. Okay, like money. And how, when, when we say that money is added to an individual's environment, that seems a little obtuse to describe it that way. What might be a more, a more common way we might say something like that? Um, okay, well now we're not dealing with money, but, you, but you're still right. Like, pause, go ahead. Like compensation? Like compensation, yeah. You do a thing, you get paid. Yeah, that's positive in the sense that money is added to the behavior's environment. And when we use this term reinforcer, what are we saying? The behavior can be more likely. The behavior 
becomes more likely in the future. So, if an individual does a thing, gets paid for it, and does it more frequently in the future, how would we categorize that consequence using this two by two matrix? Reinforcing. We would say it's reinforcing, and the consequence was positive. Positive because we added something to their environment, not because of any sense of good or bad, but we added something to their environment. Thank you. Okay, so that's a classic example of the positive reinforcement, getting paid, doing it more frequently because we get paid. What about this positive punishment? What does positive tell us right away? The consequence is? Added, being added. Being added to our to the behaviors environment, okay? But using the term punishing means? Becomes less likely. The behavior becomes less likely. What might be an example of an experience being added to a behavior's environment that may make behavior less likely? Um, you're like, you bite your nails, putting that like stuff on your nails that tastes bad. Once that stuff is on your nails, every time you bite the nails, that being the behavior, the consequence is it tastes bad. We have added a sensation as a consequence that hopefully reduces the probability of the behavior in the, in the future. Positive punishment. Okay, so let's work our way clockwise around this. How about a negative? Punisher. Negative means what? The consequence is non rewarding. Be very careful <laughs> because this is where it starts getting easily confused. Did I see a hand up over here? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we're taking something away. We're taking something away from the behavior. I think that's what you meant by non-rewarding, like the reverse of a reward. Would that be like neutral, kind of? Like non-rewarding? Like you're not getting anything taken away or added? So that's that's where I said to be very careful, because to, to negate rewarding could leave it open to neutral or loss. And so I would recommend using the, when we're, when we're saying negative, we're specifically saying a loss or a removal. So there's a loss or a removal, and because of that experience, loss or removal, using this term punisher says what? Somebody new. We're describing the consequences of punishing. We're saying that the behavior becomes less likely in the future. So a negative punisher is a loss or removal of stimulation of some sort that makes behavior less likely in the future. What might be a real world example of that? Not paying attention to a pop bowl who gets their own tantrum. What's, okay, who is behaving? Is it the person not paying attention or is it the pop bowl? I would say you're trying to change the toddler's behavior. Okay, so if we're trying to change the toddler's behavior, this is kind of in that same realm of like neutral versus loss. Mm -hmm. Does the toddler experience any loss by us not responding? I guess it depends if the person responds normally. It does, but I wanna, I wanna highlight this not responding is not an experience loss per se. And so that would fall more into extinction, which we'll talk in a, in a little bit. It's just a no consequence kind of situation. Versus an experience consequence of loss. What might be an example of that? I like where you were going. go. 
didn't do something expected, got privileges taken away, maybe a phone or something like that. As long as the non-compliance decreases in the future, it's a punisher. If non-compliance increases in the future, how would we categorize it? I see it right there. There you go, we would categorize it as a reinforcer. That's the weird part about the function. It's determined on the behavior change itself. Behavior goes up, it's reinforcing. Behavior goes down, it's a punisher. This is where we can get some really formally weird kind of stuff, like experiencing pain, producing increased behavior in the future. We would say that pain is a punisher for that individual. Or excuse me, yeah, I'm sorry. We would say that pain is a reinforcer for that individual because behavior went up. Pain is, for most organisms, a punisher. But when you get to linguistic organisms, language screws with everything. And it can really change how we experience it. So, last one, negative reinforcer. Using this term negative means what about the experience? Something's removed, something is lost. Okay. The fact that we're using reinforcer says what about the behavior? It's becoming more likely. It's becoming more likely in the future. Okay. This one's kind of strange. Something is removed, behavior becomes more likely. So here you go. I'm going to start clapping until the whole class is raised its hand. In the future, if I start clapping, are you more or less likely to raise your hand? Okay. So did removal of clapping function as a punisher or a reinforcer? A reinforcer. Usually, the most common examples of negative reinforcers are the removal of an aversive experience. <coughs> Clapping, alarms going off, strong, nasty scents, uh, eliminating a texture or a taste from your mouth, like taking in gum after lunch can be a strong negative reinforcer because of the elimination of the flavor after your meal. Yeah, negative reinforcers, kind of, kind of trippy. But I think we're a show of thoughts. How are you feeling about this? Like good, bad, eh? Okay, okay. More, more good than anything else. What's coming to mind when you're when you're looking at this two by two? What's what's showing up for you? Those, those that were like, eh, or, or bad. brings up is is really it's a really good point being clear about how the consequence is experienced can change how we categorize consequences and as he pointed out if it's in the gum example if for me the consequence is experienced as addition of a particular flavor or sweetness, then we're talking about something positive. And if my gum usage goes up, it's a reinforcer. But if my primary experience is elimination of the like oniony flavor from my lunch, 
as the primary experience, then it's negative. But if my gum usage still goes up, it's still a reinforcer. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point, and that's part of the challenge. There is part of how we experience the world. Is both of those occur? But usually we experience one or the other. And so there's some ambiguity as far as classification here. If I'm ever giving you a test question about this kind of stuff, I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> Go for the least ambiguous version. <laughs> um, or the one that's most obvious to you. And if we take points off, come back to us and be like, hey, look, there's some possible confusion here. And we'll look at a regrade. I don't, I'm not trying to punish you on this kind of stuff. Yeah. What else is showing up? Sorry, thanks, Nate. All right, so, got a video example. How many of y'all watch Big Bang Theory? Okay, maybe this won't be as popular as it thought. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, sorry, Sheldon. I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't know this. Have a chocolate. <laughs> thank you. Basically, whatever Sheldon wants. We might call it good behavior as defined by Sheldon. We'll come back to that, the fact that it's just Sheldon defining it in a second. Okay? What is the consequence for good behavior, on, for Penny's good behavior? Okay. So how does Penny experience this consequence? Positive. What do you mean by positive? You're right. Keep going. She's receiving chocolate for this behavior. There we go. Chocolate is being introduced to Penny's environment. Okay. So we would categorize it as a positive consequence. Okay. And how is the target behavior changing? How's the probability of that behavior changing? It's increasing. Huh? It's increasing. It's increasing. So we would categorize it as a, we would categorize the chocolates as a what? A positive reinforcer. A positive reinforcer. There you go. That's how we do this. Okay? Identify whose behavior. Identify what the consequence is for the behavior. Identify how the consequence is experienced. And identify how the behavior is changing because of the consequence. And that's how you do it. In performance psychology, you decide the consequence how you're going to deliver it, and then check to make sure that the function is the way you expect it to be, because sometimes things don't function the way we think, like pain or sugar. For some people, access to sugar may actually be punishing. Not for everybody, but language does weird things with expected reinforcers and punishers. Okay, so the conditioning contingency, putting the ABCs together. What is our antecedent condition for Penny? In the presence of Sheldon. Okay. Sheldon is our discriminative stimuli, our antecedent 
condition. Okay. What behavior occurs? What was our target behavior for Penny? What Sheldon wants. What Sheldon wants, a good behavior. Mm -hmm. And the consequence was? So if we're descri describing the entire conditioning contingency, we would say, in the presence of Sheldon, good behavior results in receiving chocolate. That's a full ABC contingency right there. And we can manipulate the antecedent and the consequence to change the frequency of future good behavior. Now, coming back to the fact that Sheldon is the arbiter of what is good, highlights that operant behavior includes completely arbitrary behavior, subjective, chosen by the consequent. The idea of good is something that's entirely arbitrary, socially constructed. We learn it through effective behavior among other people. And so social consequences can shape infinite and novel arbitrary behavior. This, this right here is the keys to the kingdom. Social approbation. To just say, hey, good job, nice job, is one of the most powerful reinforcers we have access to all the time with other humans. And most of a consultant-client relationship or a coach-athlete relationship or an athlete-athlete relationship is Operantly conditioned through the use of social reinforcers for arbitrary behaviors. So, performance example. On a pitch, send a ball into a goal, get paid. Antecedent, behavior, consequence. Does this only apply to humans? Nate's shaking his head, because that wasn't a trick question. The two uh, pigeons are at the rear end of a small ping pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball as it comes toward him and knocks it toward the other pigeon. The other pigeon pecks the ball back across the table. If it goes past one pigeon, the other pigeon can eat, and if it goes the other way, the other pigeon eats. So if there's a real, it's a real game. The uh, pigeon, uh, is reinforced for a cross-court shot if that is what gets the ball past his opponent. How many of you expected to watch pigeons play pinbox in today's lecture? <laughs> but this is how powerful operant condition can be. Obviously, pigeons are not linguistically bias towards linguistic kind of behavior, but even something as quote unquote simple as pigeon can be conditioned to perform. This is actually how most zoos use operant conditioning to train animals to comply with like uh, hygiene type behavior. You're not gonna force an elephant to get a foot to get like calluses scraped off, but you can sure as hell give it positive reinforcers to offer its foot or to stand there while its feet get brushed. And with humans, who are linguistically capable, that happens that much faster with that much simpler reinforcers. And language helps us cross time and place kind of barriers. Okay, so now it's your turn. Let's brainstorm some other performance examples. Where do you see operant conditioning in performance? What's that? Like training your dog. Training your dog. Okay. What's the what's the contingency? What's what's the antecedent behavior and consequence? to offer its paw. What would the antecedent stimulus be that you'd like it to offer its paw to? Like go to the 
Right. Yeah, that's the antecedent stimulus. Same paw or hand or shape. Okay. So that's the antecedent stimulus. What's the target behavior? Dog giving the paw. Okay. And what's the consequence for giving the paw in the presence of the shape from? Go. Petting, a treat, access to a toy, yeah, some sort of positive reinforcer. That's a perfect performance auditory conditioning example. Okay. How about human performance? Yeah. Go ahead. Would you say, like, in sort of a, like, if you get a yellow card after fouling, that, uh, that's a negative um, reinforcer of the fouling behavior? Okay. How is the yellow card? Uh, um, 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 um. Let's. When you say negative reinforcer, the negative term means the oh. consequence is experienced by what? Uh, taking it. The positive. So by adding a yellow card. Okay. So we're adding a yellow card. Mm. Why? When we use the term reinforcer, what are we saying about the behavior in the future? Making it more likely. Making it more likely. So. If we're saying the yellow card is a positive reinforcer, we're saying the yellow cards make fouling more frequent in the future. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm sure. okay. Yeah. Positive or negative? Uh, positive. Okay. Experiencing yellow card, getting the yellow card added to our experience. If fouling behavior decreases in the future, it functions as a punisher. Yes. So that's an operant conditioning performance example. Yeah. <coughs> what else? I actually have a yellow card as an example of something else in a minute. Anything else come to mind? Performance behavior. So, like respondent conditioning, we can modify operant behavior. But there's one extra step that we didn't talk about with respondent behavior. Because respondent behavior re relied on a reflex behavior already existing, we never had to teach an organism the behavior in the first place. But for operant, since we can literally train any kind of behavior, sometimes we actually have to shape the behavior from nothing. Okay? So we have shaping, generalization, and discrimination are always modified behavior. So shaping, most behaviors that are operant must be trained from a simpler version. You won't expect somebody to pick up a baseball the first time and just throw a perfect 85 mile an hour curveball. Not gonna happen. So we have to start with something simpler. The definition of shaping is reinforcement of progressively more complex versions of a final target behavior. And the trick to shaping is that once we have a simpler version reliably occurring, we stop reinforcing it until we see a variant show up with a little bit more complexity. If we go back to the pigeon turning example, at first we reinforced just a slight bit of turn, but once it was reliably turning left, we waited for it to turn a little bit more, and then reinforce that, and then a little bit more, and then reinforce that. Let's say we want to get somebody to run a marathon. Does anybody expect somebody to just go off the couch 26.2 miles? That would be punishing as hell. So our increments, what might be the very first increment to get somebody eventually to run a marathon? Yeah, get them to run a mile. See if they can do that on a regular basis. Reward it the first couple of times. Now that it's consistent, stop reinforcing it. What's our next targeting? Run two miles. Bingo. Okay. Now let's get them to reliably run two miles. Reinforce that when it occurs, and for a few times after that until it's regular. And then we stop reinforcing it. What might be our next increment? 
might be three, it might be four, it might be five. Mm -hmm. We might start doing a little bit bigger jumps now. I mean, these aren't like hard steps that you have to follow. You can reinforce whatever variance. Just sometimes it, you know, if you reinforce too little of a change, it doesn't actually effectively make that change reliable. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to our discussion of like, challenges need to be challenging. Mm -hmm. Operant shaping variants need to be enough different to detect for the individual being reinforced that there's a difference. Okay. So we might go to five miles, and then a half marathon, then 18, then 23. And by the time 23 is reliably occurring, that last 3.2 is not that much as a relative ratio. You know, this is actually a pretty normal like three to six month training progression for somebody that wants to do their first marathon. So, generalization. We talked about this last week in, in the context of respondent conditioning, and the idea is kind of the same. They're very, very close to the same. Most behaviors are operantly trained in the presence of one antecedent stimulus. An example that came up in class a couple times was catching a ball instead of swatting it away. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, when we train somebody to catch a ball, we'll just like lob it for the first quite a few times. We'll just lob it at them until the catch happens and reinforce the catch. And lob it until the catch happens and reinforce the catch. Mm -hmm. But once we want it to generalize, we want reinforcement of the same target behavior in the presence of very antecedent stimuli. So if we're trying to get somebody to go from like just playing toss and catch to actually being an effective <coughs> fielder in American baseball, our final target behavior is catching all kinds of hit baseballs. And so our generalization antecedents start with toss and catch and end with we're going to throw the ball, roll the ball, lob the ball, hit the ball. What else might be used as a generalization antecedent? Where the ball's thrown, like yeah. in reference to the batter. There you go. Right. We're going to throw it straight at the person, we're going to throw it to their right, we're going to throw it to their left. Mm -hmm. We might hit it high, pop flies, we might ground it, we might hit it so that it bounces hard. Mm -hmm. The more variation we do, as long as we reinforce the final target behavior when it occurs, the more the behavior is going to generalize across similar antecedent stimulus. Questions on generalization. I know this was one, there was a little bit of struggle last lecture. Okay. So what's the opposite of generalization? Discrimination. There you go. Discrimination is the opposite process. Okay. A lot of times when we're shaping, our antecedents have some degree of natural variation. Sure, we toss the ball, but maybe we toss it a little bit faster, a little bit slower. Okay. And so to discriminate a behavior to a very specific antecedent stimulus, we want to reinforce the target behavior in the presence of increasingly specific antecedent stimuli. But for discrimination in particular, we want to present a variety of antecedents so that we have both antecedents that should be reinforced and antecedents that will not predict reinforcement. And that's how we build discrimination. So let's say our final target behavior is to swing only at baseballs that are pitched within the strike zone. Usually we don't deal with the strike zone when we teach somebody how to hit a baseball with a baseball bat. So our original antecedent is something like hand toss pitches that may or may not have been in the strike zone, and we just get a generalized swinging and hitting kind of behavior. But in order to discriminate, we need to present a variety of pitches around each of the corners, the edges, some in the strike zone, some out of the strike zone, and only reinforce those swings at balls in the strike zone not reinforce those swings at balls outside of the strike zone. 
eventually the batter only swings at balls that are pitched in the strike zone. And the more training we give them as far as detecting that difference, the more we say the behavior becomes discriminating. Show of thumbs, is this an improvement on last week's discussion? No, sort of, yes. All right, cool, 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 cool. What's showing up for you guys about discrimination and generalization? <laughs> so, similar to responding conditioning, extinction is the process of making the condition behavior go away. The key part in extinction is to no longer consequate the target behavior. But we have to continue to present the antecedent stimulus a lot. If we go back to our example of the dog, training the dog to shake hands, to offer its paw. We have to continue to say paw or shake over and over and over and over again. And at first, the dog is gonna offer, offer, offer. Right? But as long as we don't actually do anything, we don't say good, good puppy or give him a snack or access to the water or whatever. And we keep saying shake, 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 eventually the dog is going to give us a metaphorical finger and walk off right, and no longer offer the paw. That's the extinction procedure. So in the African pouch rat example that we talked about last week, very, very, very discriminated signaling behavior to the presence of explosive material. The consequence for accurate signaling in the African power trap training is access to ripe banana, tasty little treat every time it accurately signals. What would we have to do to get the African power trap to stop signaling explosive behavior, uh, material? Keep making it look for the explosive, expose it to the explosive material, but you never ever give it any more banana or any other sweet treat of any sort whenever it detects, whenever it signals. And eventually, signaling behavior will stop. Like, with something as discriminated as these rats, I mean, these rats do like tens of thousands of trials to train it to this level of discrimination reliability. It takes a very long time to get that behavior to go away. Similarly, if you're working with clients who have a very deep history of training, it's going to take a very long time, a lot of repeated extinction trials before whatever behavior you're trying to get to go away actually significantly reduces the probability. performance. There's two examples of behaviors that we might put on extinction. Coach check-ins and rule following. Early on, when we're training somebody, we have to do a lot of like hands-on shaping. And we have to keep them interacting with us a lot. And so we will shape a repertoire of frequent check-ins. Hey, did I do this right? Hey, coach, did I do this right? Hey, coach, did I do this right? Like over and over and over and over and over again. But as an individual becomes more experienced at whatever their performance thing is, that checking in behavior can undermine other performance behaviors. It can become less helpful. And so not responding, prolonged non-engagement, or only engaging when the behavior is more sustainable and 
not just for every single objective, can extinguish the unsustainable behavior and put it on extinction. Now, rule following, this is kind of a funky one. Similarly, when we're teaching somebody a new sport, part of what we teach them is the rules. Do this, you're good. Don't do that, or you're bad. Lots of, lots of rule of following contingencies. But at a certain level of performance, this is usually somewhere around like upper development league, lower professional ranks kind of level. Most everybody is on the same performative level as far as ability goes. And the competitive advantage is actually working the gray area. Strategic power. Strategically violating rules and getting away with it. Or even getting penalties on other people, you know, like flopping in soccer. <laughs> like, we, as observers, a lot of times we look at this stuff and we're like, oh, that's so ridiculous that they flopped, or they really played up that, you know, whatever it may be. But that's actually a total competitive advantage. And so we don't want our performers strictly following the rules 100% of the time. And so in practice, we eliminate rule following. We, we stop contingently punishing, uh, contingently reinforcing rule following behavior. And we allow a more free for all kind of environment, <coughs> at least early on. Okay? We have to be careful about this because while we change the contingency around following rules, we need to make sure there's reinforcement for strategic rule breaking. Otherwise, you end up with like bullying and other really unsustainable kind of behavioral outcomes. But as a competitive advantage in performative kind of behaviors, rule following undermines the ability to compete at a certain level. And so we want to put it on extinction. strategic choice. And if you only ever never threw at a player <coughs> at a batter, you wouldn't have that strategy available to you and it would be a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. There's a I think I mentioned this last time. Uh, my sport was paintball. And one thing that referees would 